is the best approach to start the dialogue and what's most important um, to convey um, in understanding what womanism is, Africana womanism, and how I use it in my research. So presently, there have been, as you all know, I'm sure um, you've learned in your class, a lot of brutality um, discussed in uh, mainstream media, specifically with the killings of Mike Brown, Jordan Davis, John Crawford III, and Trayvon Martin. And so what I found important was to begin to understand how these murders continue to happen as with my own life experiences, trying to locate an angle of vision that reflected who I was, who I am, my community, and the standards and the culture of that community as well as my history as a black woman. And, and that is where I, I enter into womanism, Africana womanism, and, and begin to seek out um, very intentionally a perspective to help me frame my experiences, my history, my culture, and also, again, representative of the people that I study, who I respect and appreciate. So with that being said, I, I basically found find womanism a very useful tool to actually frame experiences that otherwise tend to get trapped um, or even left out of the conversation or even dichotomized where historically uh, black women have had to choose if you are going to be for race or will you be for gender. And oftentimes you don't have the, the, the opportunity to exist in your totality. I'm a black woman, so I can't choose either one. I have to find a political, social, and cultural space that allows me to exist in my totality as a black woman. And that's what womanism does and did for me. And so womanism for me is a problem solving angle of vision based out of black women's experiences, our everyday lives, and highlighting the way we go through our struggles on a daily basis. So I did notice that um, Dr. Johnson said, I'm talking about Africana womanism, and I, I actually use a number of different types of womanism to frame my research as well as my identity and subjectivity and my political activity. And so for me, womanism in a broad sense, and this is my definition, is primarily concerned with the ways in which people of color, particularly black women, daily employ problem-solving methods to resist, to challenge, and to transform any and all forms of oppression, seeking to build unity even amid controversy Looking at the black women's resistance tradition, a womanist perspective fundamentally deals with three major categories. And these categories were comprised from the different um, authors, uh, Chicken Women Over Yemi, Kalora Hudson Wing, Alice Walker, as well as Lady Phillips' work. Did you all have a chance to look at that article? the introduction of her womanist reader. Yes? 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 yes. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, just checking, just checking. So I developed three categories and one, the kitchen discourse, two, a testifying discourse, and three, liberatory emergence discourse. So Laylee talks about the kitchen and the kitchen table, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, you all can talk to me as well back there. <laughs> You're writing very intensely. This is good. So, what does the lady say about the kitchen, the kitchen table? You can pull up the reading if you want to. I see somebody is working. There you go. Good, good, good. Does anyone recall what the lady says about? Go ahead. Oh, uh, Philip says that the kitchen table is a is just a way to talk about womanism as in, as in it's a daily kind of thing that goes on at every household and every person's life. It's something that can be talked about amongst normal people rather than just in academic spaces. Right. So what you have is an open-ended form for the, for invitation. Okay, and if you think about the kitchen table, what do you all do at the kitchen table? You eat, and you eat with your friends, your family, right? And you talk about any and everything, okay? So it's really a metaphor. And another author you all should write down and look at is Olga Davis. And so I use some of her research, quite a bit of Olga's research, actually, because she has an article called In the Kitchen, Transforming the Academy Through Safe Space of Resistance. And she breaks down how the kitchen actually is a place where people, and specifically in that article, she's talking about black female slaves in the slave kitchen on plantations actually use the slave kitchen, even though it's a subjugated site, as a site for liberation. So that's something when you read Lady's article, I wanted you to understand that womanism most often is open to having controversy, having tension and varying perspectives and allowing for the, the, the tension between divergent perspectives and experiences and epistemologies to exist. Understanding they don't have to be resolved, okay? And that's very important because sometimes with different theories or even movement activity or some type, some idea you find people want you to they force you to choose if you are for this or for that and if you are on either side you're either in or out of the group and that's not the case with with womanism so for myself my intellectual and personal journey through the academy as well as outside of the academy, was that journey was able to exist as one through through womanism. And I wanted to talk about my experiences pre-womanism as a way to connect to some of you because I understanding the history of black feminism as well as the history of Africana womanism specifically there is this ongoing battle that is very real um, and some people actually get caught up in that battle. But fundamentally, black feminists, well, I would say the first generation of black feminists, including Patricia Hill Collins, Gloria Hall, um, Barbara Christian, they actually were more community focused than the second and third generation of black feminists. And so I know you all had a discussion about that today. So I'll take a relevant digression and then come back into womanism. But what I, what I wanted to share with you all was that for me, black feminism initially was great. I love it. And when I mean love it, where I have, Where's my book? It's always in my office. I'm in my office right now. I had that book with me like it was my Bible, okay? And some of you have read it. Some of you have read different perspectives from feminists. And that information, it resonates with you, right? Hello? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it resonates. It makes sense. Finally, somebody's talking about race 
and gender and class. Well, some white feminists don't talk about race and class, but some do, right? Because there are varying perspectives when it comes to feminism, right? So for me, when I got my hands on black feminist thought, and I got my hands on a copy initially because I had a class like you guys have right now. It was my intro to African American studies class. And the only reason I actually got to those books was because our major assignment was for us to find 10 different books by 10 different authors, black authors, and write up a criticism and a summary. Well, most of the books and novels and the fiction poetry books were, were checked out, and all I had, unfortunately, were the books by those black feminists. <laughs> <laughs> so, I remember cracking Sister Outsider back in 1995, and I found my voice. That's one of Audre Lorde's um, most significant texts. If you haven't read it, you should. You would. Um, you would love it. All right. So, I'm reading Sister Outsider. I read her books of poetry, um, and just, again, everything is speaking to me. And so I read a lot of other books by feminists, including all of Bell Hooks' books. Hooks was better earlier in her career. Later on, she started just saying anything off the top of her head. I don't know if you all have, have had a chance to hear her talk, but her earliest work is really good, right? So black feminism for me was my beginning, um, uh, was the beginning of my journey into understanding my sub subjectivity as a black woman inside and outside of the academy. And it also led me to womanism because what happened for me is that black feminism actually did not give me tools that enhance my personal life, right? My personal relationships, the community that I come from, my family is um, has a background in community activism. And a lot of things that I learned and experienced there, and even in my home, were not reflected in the work that I read through black feminism. So eventually when I get to Mormonism and I'm reading about black women's experiences and how you can exist as one and not have to resolve certain problems. I didn't have to choose if I was for gender or if I was for, for race. Womanism allowed me to have, again, a, a, a total experience. So I, I don't know about you guys, but I just wanted to actually encourage you to use all the tools that you have. I don't care if, if even if it's your degrees or whatever experiences and knowledge that you have from your communities, black feminism, Africana womanism, other types of, of womanism as well, to actually find your voice or actually the voice that already exists um, and you're just cultivating what that voice is and its specifics so that it's beneficial to you and that you have a safe space um, for yourself and not feel um, as, as if you have to, to make to, to choose. And if you ever encounter situations where you feel like you are forced to choose a certain position that denies the totality of your subjectivity and your experiences, race, class, gender, age, sexuality, you should question that perspective, okay? Because you can cause um, inadvertently dissonance, which you assume might be your own, but it might not be your personal dissonance, just you trying to fit into someone else's ideas. And so for me, womanism gave me a space to actually articulate and understand, again, who I, who I am, as well as my community, my, my history as well. So, Womanism, the way I use it, um, tends to be rather more broadly uh, applied than what um, what some people have chosen, specifically Conora Hudson Wings. 
she's actually the person who developed Afrikaner womanism. And I use a lot of her work because what she provides is a framework that actually is more dialectical. Do you all know what a dialectic is? Yes. 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 What is a dialectic? A conversation. Okay, we can start there. A conversation. Who wants to add in? I see you all reading things. I see you laughing and talking. Go ahead and share. Um, what is a dialectic? Something that's more about investigating, talking about something. Or investigating, talking about something. Okay. Anyone else? No. Well, lately talk kind of uh, about uh, dialectical experiences. Hmm? But basically when we're talking about a uh, dialectic, we're talking about two things that appear to be opposites and the tension between them actually is, it, they, they pull at each other. So it's polar two polarities that create a certain tension. I don't know if you, if you guys had a chance to read um, anything about the Hegelian dialectic, but that's where the, the idea comes from. So the work that Kalora Hudson-Wing talks about, from my understanding, looking at her work, and even lately, you don't have to choose and if, if you are going to be for or against something. You can actually be for and against something on different levels. And still be in, engaging with that particular situation. So, for instance, instead of having to choose if you are for race or gender, under womanism, the way I constructed it, I can actually, uh, I, I understand I, I don't have to choose one over the other. And black feminism um, typically prioritizes that the main issue for women is male domination. Well, womanism actually does not force you to choose. You can actually be against male domination. You can be against white supremacy. You can be against heterosexism. You can be against ageism. You can be against classism. You can be against capitalism. You can be against socialism. My point is, you do not have to choose. And as a black woman, my experience is the reality that I live and that most people live, including you all who are non-black, you live an experience that is divergent, right? Your reality is about being um, a woman of a certain class and whatever your sexuality is. So, keeping that in, in mind, Kunora Hudson Weems' um, work actually is grounded in developing more of, uh, it's more community center. And some people tend to suggest that she is not, she doesn't critique patriarchy, but actually, womanism does critique it. And actually, and actually, um, provides that critique, but not at the expense of the movement and the goals that women have in mind. So, womanism, the way I use it, um, looking at those three categories, uh, and talking about the kitchen discourse, going, going back to where we were a couple minutes ago, uh, basically, with the kitchen discourse, I explore the manner in which black women resourcefully transform subjugated sites into productively resistive, resistive locales, privately and affirmatively, self-naming black womanhood, and supporting community networks.
So if you think about what you read in Philip's piece, you can see, again, I adopted um, some of her language. Language is accessible. I know Laylee actually developed a number of characteristics of feminism, and we can talk about some of those things if you all want to. The reason I decided to actually present womanism to you this way is to show you how I adopted and adapted womanism. If you recall from the piece, Laylee does say that womanism is more intuitive and it's very flexible. And what you see when you look at different works by womanists, Africana womanists as well, is that the, there is a range of methodologies and theoretical frameworks used. And these that range of perspectives and applications of those methodologies, while they, while they might appear to not connect they are existing on a continuum, okay? So please keep, keep that in mind. So Laylee talks to us and tells us that uh, womanism's characteristics are anti-oppressionist, right? It's vernacular, right? It's communitarian. Does that sound familiar? What are some of the other characteristics? So make sure you guys are following me. What else? Does it have something to do with spirituality? I think so. I think it does. Yes, that's more about womanist methods. What are some other characteristics? But I can make sure you all are following me. Some of you are just kind of looking up here. Non-ideological. Yes, non-ideological. What does that mean? I think that just... You kind of talked about it, but the fact that you don't have to choose, or it's not like a this or that, it can be a mix of, it's not like you're against women or for women, you can choose. Okay. What else can I add to that for us? Because I just have a few more things I want to share with you, and then I'm going to have you to talk. What is ideology? A set of ideas. A set of ideas. Okay, so non-ideological means what? Extending on that young lady's comments. It's not that. It's just a, it's a way of thinking rather than a set of ideas. Or it's not based on one set of ideas? Exactly, exactly. No one is enforcing, um, you don't have, um, let's say, conceptual police when it comes to, uh, to womanism. And I say that because uh, a lot of times other perspectives, and I can tell you honestly in different groups of people I've been with, people want you, want you to be, you're a Christian or you're not a Christian? Are you a conscious black person or are you not conscious? You know, are you a feminist or are you not a feminist? What are you, right? And so womanism, again, like both of you said, it resists categorization and it's going to also resist the hierarchy of implementing one position or set of terms over another, okay? So the kitchen discourse is a dialogue that is circulating pretty much within groups and internal communities. Sometimes the experiences, the ideas can bleed or spill over into the public sphere, right? Yeah. Yeah. Womanism also, um, and thinking about the kitchen, is about redefining and transforming inferior places. Oftentimes, some people assume that just because people live in quote unquote, well, not quote unquote, in oppressed communities, that they are also um, forever relegated to um, and, and characterized as subhuman, as unfortunate, um, so 
sometimes as illiterate. Through womanism, we understand that women and, um, and people in those spaces can actually transform and oftentimes do transform those sites. They do that through the maintenance of community and share skills and talents. Whatever resources people have, they share them oftentimes. Those spaces are also used to transform and critique the stereotypes of black people, specifically in my work, transforming the stereotypes of black women. Are you all familiar with those? Yes. Yeah. 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 All right. What are some of them? Stereotypes of black women. Um, the black women, yeah. Sapphire, angry, like sassy, welfare. Yeah, folks. yeah, Jezebel. right. Abusive. Right. Mammy, yeah. black matriarch, welfare queen, the bad bitch. Okay. So, under through womanism, we also are we can see how black women resist those stereotypes to create affirming identities and cultural values. And certain characteristics about black womanhood, which are actually oftentimes demeaned or seen as as non-feminine through womanism are actually affirmed, such as being independent, being assertive, and being quote unquote sassy. Womanism is discursively heterogeneous. Through womanism, we understand that black women have multiple consciousness. There is a variation of social relationships and perspectives. Black women have a history of always working in the labor force because of gender institutional racism. So we never have fit, and most people even never fit that traditional or the ideology of the traditional heterosexual family. Black women exist in multiple jeopardy. We have to struggle against race, class, and gender oppression, and everybody else does too. Uh, black men, white women have their own experiences of struggling uh, against different types of oppression because of race, class, and gender. Very differently though. Through womanism, we also learn that through public testimony about everyday problem-solving experiences and ideas, we are able to provide a voice for a community of people that otherwise cannot speak into the public sphere. And womanism does challenge and resist the matrix of domination, which is white supremacist, capitalistic patriarchy, even though some black feminists say that is not the case. If you look at black women's history, you see the struggle has been constant and ongoing.
So I'll wrap up um, and just conclude that you know, I want you all to understand whatever perspective you use or perspectives you use, you need to make sure that you're not denying or being forced to deny your subjectivity, your community, and your values, and to make sure you are clear about what these definitions are, what these varying perspectives offer, and know what they don't offer. For me, you know, initially with black feminism, having used Patricia Hill Collins' text, uh, Black Feminist Thought, as my Bible forever, I used to take the book to my classes all the time because I had to have something to, to fight, to have something to fight in class. And it worked. Again, it did work. At the same time, I also needed something that was more adaptable to the community that I represented. And I can tell you a lot of the people that I have worked with and talked to, uh, specifically people in the movement and the quote unquote real activists, they would not accept being called or identified as a, 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 a feminist. A lot of them won't accept being identified as anything other than a community organizer or, or a revolutionary, to be honest. Um, but you have to make sure you're, you're true to yourself and not allow yourself to, to a, accept any imposition that denies the, your total subjectivity. And if that's the case, you should question that perspective. So do you all have any questions? I know I was talking for a long time. I get excited, if you can tell. I could have done a toe touch right here in the chair. You guys have some comments and questions? I actually have a question. Um, so you sure. mentioned that womanism, like, in and of itself, it kind of combats the stereotype that um, black women become this male figure. Can you hear me? Hold on, I'm losing some of what you're asking. I have to speak up the mic is hurt. Oh, I'll just scream it. Um, so you mentioned that womanism kind of combats the stereotype that black women are this manly figure. Uh, Phillips mentions that the central methodology of um, womanism is to take on this role of motherhood. How, um, it, it just seems like, how can you separate yourself from the manly stereotype when you, you use like motherhood and like kind of taking on this manly role as a method. That I, okay, it, it was still breaking up a little bit, but I think what you're saying is, how do you resist the stereotypes when at the same time, it also appears as if you embody or you are socialized into these stereotypes? Right. That's the point of womanism, because you don't have to choose. So what do I mean by that? So on one hand, we can say oppression is real. And we all know oppression is real, okay? So that we won't we won't even you know deal with that. At the same time, there is very clearly a cultural resistance, a cultural resistance in various communities where people don't live and see themselves through the totalizing discourse and power of oppression, right? So through womanism, and especially the way I use it and the way Laylee uses, uses it, even Clonora Hudson Weems, the reality that we live is about a liberation, oppression reality. And you do not have to choose. And again, my point to you all is do not choose where you are denying a part of yourself and who you are. And I say that in a very real and concrete way because sometimes there's the uh, assumption that motherhood is only constructed and lived and, and understood as a site of oppression and women choosing to subordinate themselves to children and, the, and in the family institution I want, I have to understand that there are only so many things I can control and that I should control and that, again, I have a very rich tradition of, of finding spaces, quote unquote, safe spaces, relative safe spaces, where I can affirm and even redefine 
some of these ideas, such as what black womanhood is, what motherhood is, and also what those things are not, okay? So understanding, for instance, in the history of, of black women specifically, as slave women were forced to work in the field or in the master's house, they still went home and Again, understanding the culture and the limitations of our institutions. The gender roles at that time were being accepted. And so while black women and black men were in the fields working side by side doing the same labor, right? They all, black women also went home and were taking care of their children and the household. Now don't think I'm saying that's what women should do. I'm explaining what happened, okay? Even amid Jim Crow, black women were being extremely exploited as domestic workers. Over 97 percent of black women working as domestic workers, being raped by their employers, by white men and white women. At the same time, they also were able to mobilize and they also built up uh, community resources and developed a movement called the Black Women's Club Movement. So you, who, how does a domestic worker have the agency or the gall to actually create that type of, of resistance and then do it collectively, right? In the midst of extreme, extreme oppression, so that's, again, the fluidity of, of womanism, where you can adapt and adopt it how you feel, and understanding that you should strive to actually cultivate what you intuit and understand experientially, intelligently, and intellectually. And I encourage you all to resist any any ideology, any theory, any methodology, or any group of people who force you or attempt to force you to choose, denying a part of who you are. Um, I refuse to be around any group of fools. That's not a group of fools. You can't force me to deny a part of who I am. Does that make sense, young lady? What's your name? Maria. Maria, does that make sense? It does. Um, that kind of leads to my second question. You mm -hmm. mentioned um, kind of the confines of the institution itself and like womanist activism. So Phillips says that womanist activism does not focus on the confrontation of institutional structures um, so much as it like focuses on the sharpening process of like thoughts and relationships. Um, I don't really understand how you can bring about actual activist change if you don't confront the institution because isn't it the institution that shapes the behaviors of the individual? Well, that's a great question because basically an institution is built from the people. So what Laley is doing is inverting that power dynamic. And that's what womanism does at, at its core. Womanism is really looking to get to the power and the resources that organically exist in subjugated sites of people and, and black women's experiences. And so Laley, and I, I know Laley because I took like five classes with her. She was on my dissertation committee at Georgia State and everything else like that. And I love her tremendously. So Laley is, and I, I don't want to slight her because she's phenomenal. She is more kumbaya, right? Um, she, she would like for us to hold hands. But Laley is also very, very intelligent. And so for her, instead of going to um, confront, let's say, um, Obama about wars, Laley's work actually has her involved in organizing communities in Liberia with young women. You see what I mean? So, and that's Laley's approach to womanism. And it's not an either or. She And she did write that part that way, and, and I actually, for me, I'm like, okay, that's good, and some people can choose to do that, but she's very involved in community organizing. She's very um, involved in LG, LGBT work. 
and um, again work with um, Liberian girls. And so for her, the work starts starts in the community in the in the community. You all have some comments? What do you think about womanism? I found it extremely hard to, to really understand something that Maria pointed out in the reading as well. It was mm -hmm. that uh, by allowing people to do what they normally do or what they feel like doing, that would somehow change the, change the problem. But as far as, I, as I've always seen these uh, examples of movements where things are 300 people, 400 people doing the exact same thing in a, a deliberate attempt to, to, to try to change something or try to affect something. And um, like just seeing different people doing different things, it doesn't seem like there's any like deliberate effect right. on anything. Or and that's a very good that's a very good point. And so that actually is this is a couple of things you should be mindful of. Before Lately wrote this book, there is no compilation about womanism anywhere. And that's why she wrote that book. And that's why she wrote the second book. Go ahead, get your water. You got it. Oh, she's so Okay. <laughs> so, this is that book written and published in 06. That's Lady's attempt to begin to wrap her hands around this womanism thing, right? And what you actually see with the other readings in the text, and my critique, which is why I did my dissertation on it, and which is why I still use it, is that it's so fluid. And you really can't concretize it in any specific way. And it can turn into, you know, a kumbaya moment. And that, for me, just doesn't work. Okay, my family being involved in activism. My mom was a political prisoner. I don't have time to sit in kumbaya. What I have time for is some real community organizing. Let's get to it, right? Lately, re resists, again, that economy. Because I'm assuming that I have to do one or the other. So what you actually have that's accessible and adaptable with womanism is for you to begin to take it and apply it in as many ways and forms as you see. So my dissertation actually looks at my aunt's experiences involved in the black power movement. Okay? So it's in a very it's it's in a very embryonic stage right now and a lot people haven't taken the time to start wrapping their hands around it outside of lately and myself to be honest okay and that's my that was my critique of womanism i was like i i can't use this because it doesn't have a clear methodology it doesn't have a clear theoretical framework right and my advisor is pushing me well that's the work i needed to do and so, so what i did was i developed a typology of, of the black women's resistance tradition to begin to give it some shape and some form, some type of formation that people could see, that they can touch, and they can see people's experiences. So in my typology of womanism, of, of the black women's resistance tradition and developing women's activism, I engage every black social movement to show that, yes, they were effective, but that's the work that's yet to be done. So you're right on the pulse of what's happening with womanism and its limitations. I don't disagree with you all. The work still needs to be done. So I apply it to um, black women's experiences in chattel slavery, black women's experiences in reconstruction, black women's experiences in the Jim Crow era, black women's experiences in the civil rights movement, and black women's experiences in the black power movement. So it is applicable to these other movements. And I, I, again, I understand the way she wrote it, and she wrote it so that it is open. She wants it to be open-ended. And she lives, she, she, she said this one time, she, like, she, she feels womanism in her bones, and she did say that one time in a discussion. So this is Laylee providing you with what she feels in her bones. Because she actually 
was trained and mentored by a lot of black feminists and women and Africana women. Okay, we got time for one more comment or question. Yeah. Yeah. Can you explain more where black feminism and womanism overlap, intersect, or maybe are like one and the same? And I guess articulate more where they diverge, or rather black feminisms, plural. Like how how are they complete? How are they separate? How are they different? How are they separate? Well, Laylee addresses some of that, so we can quickly look at that. Um, where Laylee, as she points out, Black feminism, um, um, on page, what is this, 24, she probably starts on 23, yeah, she starts on, on, on 23, under womanism, womanism's relationship to other perspectives, and so she does articulate some of that, and for purposes of discussion, I'm on 23, she separates womanism, feminism as identity and womanism, feminism as politics and discuss the implications of each separately. And uh, feminism and womanism are cousins. And basically what she identifies is that feminism in the Euro-American or Eurocentric framework tends to deny, has historically denied the issues around racism and white supremacy as well as class. And so she's critiquing feminism specifically on that. Feminism is often read as white women's feminism. And then black feminism actually, as well as feminism, prioritizes very explicitly male domination as the issue for women. And womanism and African womanism completely disagree. As well as African womanism. African womanism is a different um, type of womanism altogether, as well as Alice Walker's underdeveloped womanism. So she talks about those things um, in a more specific and general way than I just said. But for, for Laylee, she, she refuses to allow categorization to to be imposed on her framework and her practices as a, a womanist. And typically feminists and black feminists want to deal with only or as a priority patriarchy. And Laylee says no. As well as other other womanists, Africana womanists and African womanists. Even uh, Alice Walker, um, she doesn't create that dichotomy or that priority where, where is male domination deal with male domination first and then deal with the other issues. Okay, well, I'd like to for us to thank Dr. Gaines for speaking with us today. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, and I will uh, contact you a little bit later about the rest of the details. So thank you. All right, thank you. You have a good, good time. Great talking to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, bye-bye.